Welcome to a noob's guide to Prince Emric. This is Emric, Lord of Dragons, Crown Prince of Kalidor, whose intense relationship with dragons will have you looking up the other meaning of the word Dracophile. A free legendary lord for Total War Warhammer 2, Emric combines blistering arrogance with a blazing fast lance and a literal fire-breathing dragon, but you'll need to wait a bit before you can mount that magical sky lizard in-game. Instead, you'll start as one of the finest warriors in Ulthuan, basically Elflantis, ready to crush chaos from atop your noble steed from the get-go, because only peasants walk. Wielding a lance forged from an actual fallen star, Emric charges in faster, harder, and deeper than any other high elf, leaving anyone lucky enough to take his shaft so hot and bothered that it'll make a UTI seem mild in comparison. As the last in a long line of dragon princes, Emric sees it as his responsibility to rouse the remaining dragons from their slumber and light a fire under his fellow knights. As it turns out, a lifespan of several thousand years has the same impact on productivity as two months of home quarantine. It starts out all early morning yoga and epic poetry, but soon even changing your underwear becomes too great a quest to undertake. The Dragon Princes were once the noblest and proudest Asser Knights of Kalidor. These high elves would call out, and enough dragons would appear to impress even the Persian army. The Dragon Princes would then mount up and ride into battle atop these scaly flamethrowers. They would call upon their god Val to bless their armies with flaming attacks and help their dragons puff harder than Michael Phelps, leaving the enemy grumbling that smoke circle etiquette does not apply to Olympic athletes, or to invoke the name of Eldrazor, who granted the lords and nobles of Kalidor experience and expertise in battle, though at the cost of relations with other high elves. Not that the dragon-thirsty Kalidorians cared, which might go on to explain what happened next, as in Kalidor, the skies no longer ring with the cries of dragons. Instead, it's a silent realm, with only the echo of elven footsteps in empty ancient ancient halls. The dragons now sleep in the mountains, refusing to wake even for the smell of fresh pancakes and bacon. So now, these same dragon princes ride into battle atop horses that have had their rides pimped by exhibit, caparisoned in armor forged to look like a dragon if you tilt your head to the side and squint really hard. Because who wants to go out and find a dragon anymore? It's dirty in the outside world, and I hear ethnic food gives you the runs. So instead, the dragon princes stay at home and never live up to their potential or the expectations expectations set by their ancestors, which seems to be a common theme among dragon princes. Emric, descendant of the first dragon tamer, is one of the few who can still wake the dragons in times of need, and then only a handful, as Emric alone still fights in the traditional manner of his gloriously noble house. During the Great Chaos Incursion, Emric fought to the last elf to keep the slumbering dragon safe, and as he lay dying on the mountainside, a single dragon, Minathnir, woke to his cries for help deeming this hero of his people the first worthy champion in a millennia. And it was his new dragon life-bonded buddy, Minathnir, that told Emric the truth, that your average high elf is too narrow-minded and lazy to summon a dragon the right way anymore, and only someone with Emric's cojones could use the true dragon song, an ancient tune that draws on the singer's chutzpah to wake even more dragons. And with this knowledge, Emric crafted a special instrument, but no elf wanted to believe it, believe it even existed, and when the truth finally dawned, it dawned in fire, and he blows the dragon horn. I love that CA made it so there's an elf now who actually toots his own horn. And that's where your Imric campaign starts, with an elf who's set out from his homeland in search of his birthright, followed by an army fed entirely on braggadocio and smug. Luckily, he's not alone in his quest, as you'll begin each campaign with a contingent of Dragon Prince cavalry, a sun dragon, a rather friendly fire mage, and a bodyguard of white lions of trace. Not the awesome furry ones from the DLC, but the ones that murder them and then wear their skulls. And since nobody understands that riding a high-flying dragon would leave you frozen and oxygen deficient, you'll find no shortage of dragon princes looking to mount a sky snake at your expense. So dragon princes and dragons both recruit one turn faster for Emric. And since these both require more maintenance than an aging Alfa Romeo, Emric also comes with a 25% reduction in their upkeep, since you don't want to begin turn two bankrupt and slinking back home to your parents' basement for the third 
time. Imric's unique red skill line doubles down on this elf's commitment to princely superiority, focusing on unlocking noble heroes, buffing dragon princes, and ensuring that any dragons you do summon will be second only to Jon Snow's epic abs, because Rule 63 High Elf Khaleesi doesn't have time for any bourgeois belly draggers. And even though Imric can recruit regular dragons, this is Prince Emric of Kalidor, not Baron, and certainly not Marquis, so he only wants to have super dragons. Having seen a map with the words, here there be dragons at some point, Emric is set out to dominate Balgag and Mount, only the best scaly ladies in his path, which makes your goal in Emric's campaign to be the very best, like no one ever was. Just watch out for ice-type Pokemon. Every 10 levels, a legendary dragon will be sighted near Emric. Stepping into this marker allows you to parlay with these mythic beasts of destruction, and since Emric spent a millennia learning to speak Dova, they have a surprising amount to gab about. You can even consult the dragon for a temporary buff to your army, bargain with him to increase your elven influence, or dragon rend your favorite flying iguana and tell him to soar his fat ass down here for a battle challenge, as that's the button that lets you recruit the dragon afterwards and then keep them, as well as giving you a permanent trait boost and a badass item. Though you'll first have to fight these scaly gold diggers and their thematic late game armies who aren't about to roll over for the first wandering blue blood they come across. Though you should know that attacking every dragon you come across is like the rhythm method. It seems like a good idea at the time, but you'll be paying for it the rest of your life, cause dragons be expensive. And soon enough, you'll have so many dragons to choose from, the game looks more like Dragon Tinder. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Or at least that's how Imric sees it, as he believes every dragon is just thirsting to be mounted by his princely body. In a world where High Elves are notorious for their vanity and hubris, Imric is their Val Kilmer, who combines the fighting abilities of Mad Mardigan, the swagger of Doc Holliday, and the whatever Iceman does here, to become the most daring and electric fighter in Uthwan. This has also left Imric with a reputation as hard to work with, leaving room for those snooty High Elf twins Tyrion and Teclis to steal your Oscar. I mean, become Phoenix King. So what's an overpuffed method dragon rider to do but dust Ulthuan from his high-flying feet and go out and seek a world of adventure? In the Mortal Empires, you'll begin on the far side of the world in the Plain of Bones, the ancient graveyard of dragons, which is now overrun by Grimgore, Malice Darkblade, and Deathmaster Snitch, all of whom would love to take Imric's ego down by a few notches. But being surrounded by burly men who want to shank him is just how Imric likes it, as there's no glory in defeating second-tier losers. And once you mop up these jealous wannabes, you can reignite the War of the Beard and work your way up the mountains one dwarf hole at a time, as Imric prefers to settle in mountainous terrain, because, I mean, where else would you expect to find dragons? Imric's Vortex campaign has him joining the race to stabilize its wild energies, as his forefather was the one who actually created the Vortex to begin with, and Imric is duty-bound to uphold his work. So you'll begin your Vortex campaign deep in the shifting sands of the southern deserts, trying desperately to remember what water tasted like. Though thankfully, a lifetime spent around fire-breathing behemoths has left Imric immune to these pseudo-Saharan winds, and his army takes no attrition damage while they're in the desert. Which is bad news if you're a Tomb King, as yet another flaming lord is about to play a Rush-inspired drum solo on your bandaged backside. Imric's Ashen Fields ability makes any enemy 20% weaker to fire damage, and his blazing lance turns all his attacks into Molotov cocktails, because anytime you throw one, boom, right away you have a different problem. In this case, the problem is keeping your enemy alive long enough to use any of your other sweet dragon abilities. As these ruffians thank you for burning them to majestic cinders, you'll gain influence over court politics back in Ulthuan, but as these are the same high horse elves that sneered at you before, you're far better off saving that influence for the moment you complete your second quest chapter, as you can spend the influence to confederate your home of Kalidor and return home a champion to retake your rightful place in the Phoenix Court. Because Imric's campaign isn't about working alongside pompous, arrogant, dagger-eared dandies. It's about showing them who should be the fop in chief of the Ruffled Isles. So don't expect to make any friends on your way to the Gilded Throne. A united Ulthuan may be necessary for ultimate victory over chaos, but in the official lore, Imric couldn't even convince the 
themselves to pull their heads out of each other's asses long enough to fight back. And when they asked to use the dragons he had spent so long collecting, he told Tyrion to go sit on the Sword of Cain and spin, threw a bunch of tea in the harbor, and then declared Kalidor a new and independent nation. And when the final battle of Ulthuan came, it was Imric and his elvish Texans who shattered the power-mad Tyrion's armor. Imric who paved the way to victory, and Imric who was the last elf standing when the field was littered with the dead and dying. Because in the end times, Imric was Walter from the Big Lebowski. He wasn't wrong, he was just an asshole. And the elves needed someone to roundhouse kick them back into the fray. Someone with an unstoppable wildfire flame in their heart, who wasn't afraid to burn enemies to ash as far as the eyes can see. Someone who hated the ending of Game of Thrones even more than you did. So saddle up your dragon and take to the skies, because Prince Imric of Kalidor does not waste time on the unworthy. So raise the dragon banner and be ready to soak the world in fire. The visuals for this noob's guide were filmed by House of Danion, who you can catch streaming on Twitch. Then if you enjoyed this one, then I suggest you check out some of the other ones on the channel. You can subscribe to find out when more are made, or join the channel to help support the creation of them in the future. Thanks for watching.